This is True North TV, powered by Communitech, from Waterloo Region, Ontario, Canada, to the world. The conversations you need and want to hear with interesting people on topics at the intersection of technology and humanity. Tech for good. Let's get started. Thanks, Talia, and welcome to True North TV. We've got uh, a bit of a different approach today. We've got two people joining us on the program, both from East Entire. Uh, we've got Jay Haynes and Mark Sangster joining us here today uh, to talk about cybersecurity. Jay and Mark, thanks so much for joining us. So Jay, the um, cybercrime, tell us a bit about uh, what that is and, and what are the risks associated with it? And do we really have a sense, is there a you know, does anyone really truly appreciate the risks that are present, both within their own companies, but also, you know, the impact that cybercrime can have on things like money laundering and the erosion of trust and, and, and really robbing us of, uh, of, of all, you know, so much money, both as individuals, as corporations and as countries? Well, it's, um, it's now the single largest category of crime, uh, surpassing drugs and human trafficking combined. Uh, depending what stat you read, it's, it's in the trillions um, and growing. Um, I would say, you know, based on us observing, um, you know, traffic in over 3,000 data centers around the world, um, it's, um, it's well over 90% of uh, the, the criminal activity is opportunistic. And... Um, it's not nation states. Um, it's, it's one of the unfortunate things in the industry is they use a lot of Hollywood to, to you know, make it look like you've got, you know, you know uh, Asian country leaders, uh, you know, coming in your network to steal your personal information. That's not it. It's, uh, for the most part, it's um, opportunistic criminals that, um, you know, the analogy being you leave your front door open on Main Street, someone's going to walk in and steal the TVs out of the appliance store. And that's exactly what's happening. So there's a lot of uh, times it's been, you know, uh, referred to as there's two kinds of companies, those that have been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. And that could never be more true than now. Uh, give me some examples of what would you, you know, what are some great examples of some of the incredibly silly things that we do to put ourselves at risk? Oh gosh, uh, that list is long. In fact, um, you know, the thing that we cannot patch is human behavior. And um, that has become basically the lightning rod for adversaries to exploit. So, um, you know, the, they will uh, lure you in emails or websites, play to um, vanity, greed, um, all the usual uh, uh, human fear, uh, human uh, motivators, and, um, and try and compel people to do something such as, you know, as simple as clicking on a link or uh, surrendering credentials that um, then the bad guys use to log in as you. And that's one of the big challenges uh, in cybersecurity is uh, there's so much credential theft that, um, that bad guys are wandering around the network doing stuff that, um, that they're permitted to do because they they're acting as you. And once they get in, then it's, um, you know, what can I monetize now that I am in? Um, you've probably heard of ransomware. That's uh, that is the new scourge. Uh, highly effective. Uh, the you know as long as people keep paying ransoms to get their business back, um, the bad guys will continue to figure out more creative ways to to get in. Uh, that's just the most current one. Um, you know, stealing your information, selling it to someone else, getting a beachhead in your organization, and selling the access to someone else. Like there's a whole supply chain that that uh, that thrives under underneath the. Uh, the covers here. Yeah, so it's it's fascinating. You know, I I, I would have thought that the um, uh, that the you know the big companies would have made the necessary investments to uh, protect protect themselves. Um, but then every once in a while, you turn around, and of course, uh, you know, another another big credit card company, aspects of a federal department, or um, uh, you know, automotive manufacturers are are reporting that they've been they've been breached, that they've been hacked. How 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 protected are people? Are people 
uh, taking, you know, do they truly understand the consequence? I mean, what is it that is leading to uh, these kinds of hacks? Some of those um, um, hacks that you uh, have recent, uh, mentioned recently uh, with some of the largest banks, uh, uh, one of them was a misconfigured um, S3 bucket in Amazon. And, um, and everything, you know, the horse was out of the barn before they figured it out. And it was, you know, it wasn't Amazon getting hacked, it was the configuration of it uh, in that particular uh, workload that, that w allowed the adversaries to, uh, to move the um, uh, sensitive data. So, so these sorts of things um, are going to be accelerated because once you get into the cloud, um, you don't have the protection of the perimeter that we used to know the office network. Um, you are protected in, in some respects by being within the firewall. Um, now your, your perimeter is all over the place. You carry it in your, in your pocket with your phone. Um, you're working remotely. Right now in the pandemic, we have a lot of remote perimeters. Um, that, um, that is inevitably connected to some cloud asset and the, the, the obligation on the security organizations and uh, originally the R&D organizations to build security into it has never been uh, higher. And now Mark, um... Uh, I've got a similar question for you, but um, uh, I understand that there's uh, certain kinds of people who are well suited to um, working in the realm of uh, a cybersecurity company like uh, eCentire. Um, and, and one of the, the sort of uh, uh, prerequisites is uh, extensive uh, uh, gaming. Uh, tell me a bit about about that and, and is it just something, is it an urban lift that, myth that I've heard on, on the streets or, or it, does it actually, is it something you look for when you're recruiting people to be part of each center? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm gonna borrow from one of Jay's sort of uh, coined phrases, which is, you know, our, our security analysts are a combination of three things. And one of them is gamer, one of them is administrator, and the other one is air traffic controller, right? Because they are within 35 seconds triaging events when they come in. So when alert appears on a board, they have to react quickly. They have to then determine whether or not there's, there's secondary and third steps that have to be taken. They go through that investigation and in situations where they do find something suspicious and it does bear out and they know they have to take some kind of containment action on behalf of that client. So whether that's blocking traffic or quarantining a device or whatever it needs to be. Um, and it really is, you know, um, you know, to some degree, hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? We, we think of uh, threats as being this sort of, you know, Skynet robots that come along and you happen to visit a website you shouldn't have clicked on a link and bam, this bot's on your computer and it does something autonomously, but it's not. We call it hands-on keyboard attacks because there are criminals in those adversaries on the other side who are effectively driving and guiding, right? They are on your keyboard attacking and that's why we need stock analysts who know how to respond in that kind of call of duty type of manner right to be able to counter whatever measures they come forth with so all those parents who are yelling at their kids to stop playing serious video games um, maybe there's a career for them in cybersecurity. yeah absolutely right and and you know i think in the in the local community and and we actually work globally as well the educational institutions have done a good job at investing in those and creating, you know, master's level programs and working with industry. And in fact, we lead in that, in that respect, working with those uh, institutions to help them, you know, guide curriculum as an example and look at what do we see the threat landscape look like? What type of technology we're using? What are the approaches, the, the methodologies and so on that we use to defend these clients so that they're coming to market and they're, they're effectively already trained when they come out of that educational boot camp and they're ready to go. So, Mark, um, you're not only the VP at uh, eCentire, you're also um, an award-winning speaker. Uh, you're a, you're a go-to uh, analyst for uh, media organizations such as CBC and the Wall Street Journal. And you're an author, of course, with this new book you've just launched called No Safe Harbor. Can you unpack that for me? Tell me a bit about the title and you know, where this book come from and, and what, what's your goal in, in, in making the huge investment in writing it? Yeah, well, as Jay would tell you too, that, you know, our job is to keep our clients out of the headlines, but the reality is it's below the headlines where the real information is and the real truth. So we get caught up by the big Fortune 500 companies that are affected. You know, you mentioned a few of them, the retailers, the travel industry, the bank is, um, banking institutions, and so on. But the truth is, 
the vast majority of these attacks target small to medium sized enterprise. And these types of stories, I think because they're not Fortune 500, because they're not public, we don't necessarily hear them. And the reality is these companies become those sort of silent victims, right? And, and because of their silence, other companies cannot learn vicariously. So it's this constant repetitive, you know, kind of uh, lather, rinse, repeat when it comes to cyber attacks. And the point of the book was to tell some of these stories, not obviously out clients, but look at what had happened across the industry so that they could learn from them, right? This wasn't to say, look, this is where they made mistakes. It was actually to look at all of the factors, the systemic issues, the human error and so on so that they stop treating security as an IT problem to solve and they start considering it a business risk that they have to manage. It's, it's so interesting because, I mean, the reason I, I came to you and, and uh, had you tee up the book to begin with is, uh, you know, one of the uh, biggest um, risks that we have for the companies is, is with the small and medium-sized enterprise that don't have the, you know, capacity or the resources necessary. Um, but, but, and they need to protect themselves. And we hear anecdotally, there's a lot of secrets around ransomware out there that never surface. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who have been victims of them, um, and, and no one ever knows. It never gets reported. Um, what can SMEs do? A, how, how ready are they? Um, and what do they need to do to protect themselves? Well, the vast majority of those companies aren't ready, right? And that's the problem, right? So they don't see themselves as a target. They think they're too small. They work in a business that's not that interesting to criminals. Maybe they don't have assets, right? We're sort of trained to think about assets as money, right? So we see a direct connection to banks, for example, right? The old adage of, you know, bank robbers rob banks because that's where the money, are, uh, the money is. But assets in other forms, healthcare records, uh, legal information, mergers and acquisition data, uh, trading algorithms, all these other pieces are very interesting and they can be resold. And, and when you allude to ransomware, the reality is we almost see three pronged attacks now, right? One is massive ransomware attacks to create operational disruptions like we've seen in hospitals through COVID as an example. And then you're looking for some kind of payment to restore those operations. But there's more than that. There's the assets that were also stolen. So, well, you know, it's the, uh, the uh, illusionist's trick, right? Watch the one hand while the other one is picking your pocket. Um, so they're, they're exfiltrating that information. They resell that. And then the third piece, of course, is after they've done this to you, then they turn around and they say, we'll tell you what, we won't make this public if you pay us another fee. And a few big name companies have been, have been burned by that. So really the first step I'd say, because it's a very complicated uh, discussion, is realize you are a target. You do have assets that are worth stealing and now consider how you're going to work with experts in that field to help you prevent that from occurring, right? So understanding what your risks look like, where your vulnerabilities are, how do you train and make your staff aware? And frankly, how do you make your executives aware? Because often that biggest uh, security gap exists at the C-suite and at the board level. So I'm going to open this one up to uh, Mark or Jay, but, you know, as human beings, what do we often get wrong about cybersecurity? Uh, well, you can start with uh, the, it won't happen to me. Um, and, uh, or, you know, um, I'll, I'll take my chances. Uh, those are, are naive. It's, it's uh, inevitable. Um, everyone will ultimately be a victim in one form or another, um, you know, both personally and, um, and in the business. Well, it's interesting because you, you, you made the, the comment about um, there's two kinds of people in the world, those who have been hacked and those who aren't aware that they've been hacked. Yeah. Is, it, is it really that prevalent? It absolutely is. Uh, there are so many um, beachheads uh, planted in business networks that aren't being activated, but uh, bad guys know that they're in there and uh, you know, they don't last forever because you know, IT organizations go through refresh cycles, but that's you know, it's sort of like the fisherman that throws out, you know, a thousand lines and he can only, um, he's only going to, you know, take the fish on the, the biggest fish on the, on the one that's fighting the hardest. But all the other ones could end up uh, at some point getting a fish on the line. So, so that, that's a good way to think about it. Mark, um, you know, we, we, we've heard about where we believe many of the bad actors are located. We've heard about countries like Russia and um, parts of Southeast Asia and China, and do we do we actually know? Um, and is there you know sort of a critical mass of bad actors? 
Yeah, without a doubt, there, there are certainly sort of the hot spots in the world, right, where we do see a lot of this activity. In fact, there's a term that's recently been coined and is now sort of floating in the government circles where they call them um, gray zones or gray actors. And what they're referring to here is, I would say, our generation's Cold War. So it's that notion of we're going to do everything south of full-on military action. Um, but, you know, everything else is, is in fair play, right? So we will disrupt operations in hospitals during a global pandemic. Uh, we will test our ability to shut down utilities. We'll rob banks. You know, we'll we'll um, hinder or, in other ways, you know, disrupt operations in manufacturing facilities, et cetera. And you know, they're doing this because that gives them the geopolitical gain that they would potentially, um, you know, uh, garner through other sort of, you know, more kinetic actions like war. Um, but the the biggest piece of this i think is the fact that it makes it in some ways harder to attribute and it becomes harder to respond to because you know imagine being a, a western power you know the us or canada or australia for example that just put out alert about this and then saying listen we want to take some kind of you know uh significant um, um forceful action against these countries because they're attacking us well everyone else is going to look at them and say well you know they're not flying bombers over you they're not dropping bombs their soldiers are not on your land you know you don't have the right to do this so it becomes very hard to respond and it's a brilliant way i think of of leveling the playing field because you can look at superpowers like the us as an example that has you know extreme military force but when you take that out of play now they're chasing you in mountains and they're looking for you in caves, right? These are, uh, you know, or they're running through the jungle and they can't bring in, you know, armored vehicles and so on. So it becomes that hand-to-hand -hand combat and they are doing that. So to some degree, it's very difficult to attribute. In other cases, yes, you know, links to China, to Russia, to the Ukraine, destabilized Baltic region, uh, parts of, the, of South Asia, et cetera, we see heat up. And I think what's also important to understand this, particularly for the viewers, is that in a lot of ways we think about these nation state or gray zone type of actors targeting government and utilities and so on. And that's true, but they do also target business. So when we see things like missile exchanges in the Middle East, when we see trade wars and, and geopolitical um, uprisings and so on, the reality is those tectonic events create aftershocks and those aftershocks are felt by small and medium business where countries like Iran decide, well, you know, I can't attack, again, I can't go a full frontal assault with missiles and rockets and so on, but what I can do is, you know, go and disrupt your manufacturing or maybe shut down a hospital for a day or two, because I know that's painful and I know it's public and that also um, fosters mistrust between the population and its government. So we can, we can be, uh, we can be defensive, but we can't be offensive in this cyber war that we're in now. Uh, I mean, we can. There's lots of talk about this sort of this this issue of you know taking the fight to the enemy, right? And you know why why can't we do what they do? And in fact, uh, years ago, uh, Jay and I were in the offices of the chairman of the American Bar Association. We talked a little bit about this. And he actually, he talked about what he called the international um, leveling of punishment. And, and the simple fact is, we're never actually gonna put certain cyber rules and laws in place because we too are actually doing this. But that, that tends to be the domain of, of the government, right? Of five eyes and so on, uh, the US, Canada, the UK. It's not something that I would highly recommend companies do. As it is now, as Jay said, these are opportunistic attacks. The last thing I think you want to do is sort of shoot back at the enemy and paint a bullseye on your chest because if they decide to put their sights on you, you know, they're going to get you, right? The, 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 the reality is they, have, uh, they are well-trained, they are well-armed, um, they are well experienced and you know, I, I don't know in my book, that's not necessarily who I would decide, you know, my first fight is going to be against that uh, heavyweight. I, I'm, I'm curious, um, do, we, do we have a sense, do we know, uh, you know who the enemy is? Um, is, it, is, it, uh, is it organized crime? Is it individuals in, um, in, in the Ukraine who have nothing to lose? Is it, uh, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, potentially some, some government uh, may or may not be involved in these types of, of uh, insurgencies do we, do we have a sense as to you know what's the face of the the cyber hacker look like yeah you know i put them in three broad buckets here so the first is the you know the let's talk about the state sponsored or the nation states right these are soldiers employed by a country right to uh 
um, to act against its, you know, supposed enemies or its adversaries. Um, but really, most of the activity we see comes from um, opportunistic or smash and grab criminals, and the other ones are organized cartels. So when we think about the smash and grab criminals, these are the people in destabilized nations, right, who have economic challenges, and they probably have two PhDs and, you know, one in brain surgery and one in rocket science, but the reality is they're driving a cab for $50 a day. Or, you know, they can use some very simple, highly available cyber tools, and they can steal thousands of dollars from faceless people on the other side of the globe, right? And we really do have to think about the socioeconomic drivers that are accelerating cybercrime. But on the organized side, the cartels, as an example, um, they operate like Fortune 500 companies, right? They train, they hire, uh, they hire the best. Um, they work within their own ecosystems. In fact, we're seeing to the point where, you know, we use SaaS-based tools, for example, to, you know, accelerate our time to market, reduce our operational costs. We we'll do the same thing. If there's successful malware out there or delivery mechanisms for malware, they license it. And, and other criminals say, well, heck, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go and invest the time and effort um, to develop this myself when there's a successful tool out there, right? So, you know, we're talking about uh, lowering operational costs, accelerating time to market, and increasing the likelihood of revenue because these tools do have a high efficacy, right? So, you know, reduced costs, increased revenue is profit. It's the same models that we in our world and in the way we develop technology or partner to bring technology to the market, it's the, it's the, it's the same MBA kind of principles. Interesting. Uh, Jay, um, as, we, as we think about this, is there, is there such a thing as a, a, a Robin Hood hacker, an ethical hacker who's playing some sort of role that, that has a, a bright side in this? Uh, yes, yeah, so actually it's one of the services that we offer. Um, you know, we call it red teaming or white hat. Uh, so basically you use all of the tools as Mark was describing that are uh, widely available. Um, you don't have to be, you know, uh, an awesome um, uh, developer of malware. All that stuff is easily downloadable. Um, and, and so what we do is use a combination of those tools to identify where organizations have blind spots or weaknesses or vulnerabilities, things that can be exploited. And it's a constant game of cat and mouse. And, you know, it's, it's like I said, you know, leaving that front door open. Okay, now we got the front door locked. Uh, we've got the windows on the side lock. We might find the back door open. Um, it might not be uh, last week, but things change every, every day, every hour of the day. So it's a constantly, and, and this is actually one of the, the challenges you have as an industry to, to thwart the crime that like the problem is never solved. It's always on the move. It's always in motion. It's, it's, it's probably one of the most dynamic uh, sectors for um, change. You know, I would say that I didn't have ADD before I joined, but I've acquired the syndrome, and that's actually a feature <laughs> of anybody in the industry. You know, we're, uh, we're all uh, based here in Waterloo Region, and, um, you know, we have um, uh, a very strong um, security and cybersecurity bench strength in the community. Uh, and there's a story that's going to be coming out shortly about, um, about the, the, the code breaker. Um, who ended up being a prof at the University of Waterloo and the impact that 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 person had on on building, you know, such strong cybersecurity capability in our community. There's also another 1,400 technology companies in Waterloo region. Are they, as SMEs, any better at this than, you know, manufacturing companies or are they still leaving the front door open? That's an interesting question. They, um, you know, they have... Um, they're at an advantage of at least knowing um, of these uh, 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 risks that manufacturing companies that aren't in the circles, that don't attend community technology events, they just aren't getting the exposure to it. So, so they certainly are, um, you know, they have every opportunity to, to be in there, but they're also, um, you know, they're competing with companies all over the world that are in a rapid, uh, um, you know, time to acquire customers, uh, high growth, you have all kinds of pressures in, uh, in building a business. So, so uh, how much they choose to invest in um, mitigating their risk and protecting their reputation is a business decision, as it is in any organization. If you look to the finance sector, more than any other, they've had to deal with this uh, 
probably a good 10 years ahead of everyone else. Just just to add to what, what Jay said is, is you're right. I think a lot of these companies are now aware. So when they're dealing with things like DevOps, they're, they understand now because of all these breaches that have been made public, right? What they, that they, they have a, a, an accountability here and a responsibility. So part of the audience today are going to be people who are interested in, in cybercrime, uh, cybersecurity, uh, but there's also going to be a whole bunch of people who are parents today watching the show. Their kids going back to school. What advice do you have for parents to, tr to try and keep their, their kids, their families and themselves safe at the individual level? You know, really, this is looking at this as a partnership. So do your research and understand what some of the risks are as well, right? Look at some of the government um, uh, mandated regulations or recommendations, I should say, and work with that uh, academic institution. So whether it's a public school, private school, whatever it may be, to understand what those risks are and to make sure they've covered it. So think about it, not just from the, you know, the, the sort of the perspective of the pandemic, right? We've, we've put a lot of that into place now, right? A lot of the controls in place will do the same Thing with cybersecurity. So make sure your children, for example, are educated when it comes to using video conferencing tools, because we saw a lot of that, you know, became known as Zoom bombing, where if you had a public event or you posted the link publicly without any kind of controls like passwords or a waiting room, unwanted individuals could join. And then, of course, if you allowed them to share their screen, they could share all sorts of, let's say, you know, kindly colorful content that you had very little control to stop, particularly for those that didn't understand. I was asking, you know, the parents who had kids who were anywhere between sort of eight and 18, you know, what measures they were taking to protect them from, um, you know, either, you know, some sort of cyber attack or, um, you know, some sort of surveillance on what it is they're spending time do doing online. And the answer was about 90% of them were doing nothing. Relying on the, uh, the companies that are supplying the, uh, the services uh, that the kids are using to ensure their safety, and, and you can't. You know, uh, listening, spending time with the, with the good people of, uh, of East Entire, I always come away thinking that you all really need a cape uh, because you're crime fighting um, in a way in real time. Um, and, and, you know, what you're doing is absolutely remarkable, and we're very very proud of you all. I'm very proud to have you in this community because um, you contribute so much. Normally, uh, of course, True North is a festival that was planned to go from 2,500 to 25,000 this year, and, and it will again in the future. Um, but the, the anchor of uh, True North it has always been around tech for good. And I think there's probably no better example of tech for good in our region than the good work that, that you all do. Well, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you both very much for joining us today. It's a, it's a fascinating field. And of course, we are customers of East Entire. Um, and, uh, and I encourage you to think about and make um, your, your cybersecurity part of your overall strategy as a corporation. I also encourage you to buy the book. I have read the book. Uh, I actually got to read it before it was officially published. Um, and I think it is a fabulous tool with which to really begin to understand uh, the implications for you as a, as a leader uh, and some of the things you need to get started on right away to protect yourself uh, and your company. Again, thank you all very much for joining us here today for Truth North TV. We're going to be back next Tuesday with our next episode. Have a great day. Thanks for watching this episode of True North TV. To catch the next episode, subscribe to Community Text Channel.